All right, so let's go over some questions to review some uh, things that might come up on cardiology questions on USMLE. So a 54-year-old man is being hospitalized for COPD exacerbation. While you're doing your morning rounds, you're notified that he's in cardiac arrest. When you arrive to his room, you'll find that he's unresponsive and pulseless. CPR has been initiated, and his EKG looks like this. So which of the following is the best first step in the treatment of this patient? Is it A, amiodarone, B, lidocaine, C, epinephrine, D, synchronized cardioversion, or E, non-synchronized cardioversion? And the answer is E, non-synchronized cardioversion. So this is a patient that is in code blue. And what you should have uh, been thinking is between D and E. So anytime that, well, or maybe even C, D, and E. Uh, so anytime that a patient is pulseless, you know that you're going to be uh, code blue. And remember that if it is, uh, there, are, there are two different kinds of rhythms. There's the shockable rhythms and the non-shockable rhythms. The shockable rhythms include VTAC and VFib. Of course, this is a patient in VTAC. Uh, and then there are the non-shockable rhythms, which would be uh, the asystole and pulseless electrical activity. So if a patient is in VTAC or VFib, we give them a shock before we administer any medication. Of course, we start EKG before that. We know, or sorry, we start CPR before that. Um, but uh, the first thing we're going to do medically is we're going to shock them, and then we'll give them drugs if we need to. Whereas if it's a non-shockable rhythm, then if we're just going to jump right to the drugs. So this is VTAC. So VTAC or VFib is a shockable rhythm. And so really what it comes down to is... What's the difference between synchronized cardioversion and non-synchronized cardioversion? Synchronized cardioversion is the non-emergency cardioversion, the way I like to think about it. These are the patients that have an arrhythmia, but they also have a pulse. So it's not super, super emergency. Whereas the non-synchronized cardioversion or defibrillation is for the patients who have an arrhythmia and they don't have a pulse. So this is for patients who have VFib or VTAC and they don't have a pulse. You can have VTAC and have a pulse, that's possible, and in that case you would use synchronized cardioversion uh, or you could use medical therapy. VFib will never have a pulse, so that's why they call this defibrillation, because we always use it for VFib. So VFib or VTAC without a pulse will go right to defibrillation, non-synchronized cardioversion. And like I mentioned, if the patient is in asystole or has pulseless electrical activity, so if some kind of pulseless or some kind of rhythm but no pulse, then the first step is going to be medical. Uh, so while we're uh, giving the CPR, we're going to be administering one milligram of IV epinephrine. And the simple reason behind that is you can't defibrillate uh, something that's not a rhythm. And pulseless electrical activity, uh, the problem behind that is that while you're getting a pulse, you're not getting, uh, or while you're getting electrical activity, you're not getting a pulse. So you can shock somebody and put them into electrical activity, but, uh, or into a rhythm, but you're not going to get a pulse from that. So we have to give them medical therapy. Uh, so hopefully I made that clear. So VFib, VTAC goes straight to defibrillation. And then, of course, you'll go through your ACLS protocol. You can give them epi you'll give them one milligram of epinephrine or uh, vasopressin, and you'll just go through that cycle. Uh, whereas asystole or PEA, you'll go straight to epinephrine or, or uh, to vasopressin. Okay. So question two, a 29-year-old female presents to your primary care clinic because she has not menstruated in two months. She says that normally her menstrual cycles are irregular, but this is abnormally long for her. Physical exam reveals a moderately overweight woman with some facial hair growth, but no other remarkable findings besides a mid-systolic click with a, mid -systolic, or a mild systolic murmur. Which of the following is the best next step in, uh, actually, sorry, which of the following is the most likely cardiac diagnosis in this patient? So ignore that part. What is, which of the following is most likely cardiac diagnosis in this patient? 
is it A, aortic stenosis, B, aortic regurgitation, C, mitral stenosis, D, mitral regurgitation, or E, mitral valve prolapse. And the diagnosis in this patient is E, mitral valve prolapse. So this is a patient who is pregnant, uh, more than likely, because she hasn't menstruated in two months. Uh, I made this first part particularly confusing uh, just because I want you to know that a mid-systolic click with, uh, with or without a systolic murmur, that mid-systolic click is, is characteristic of mitral valve prolapse. So you should be honing in on that uh, if you're asked what the most likely cardiac diagnosis in this patient. This patient also has other diagnoses. One, she is probably pregnant. Uh, why? Because mitral valve prolapse tends to present for the first time in women who are pregnant. Because when you're pregnant, your, uh, your intravascular volume increases. So because your intravascular volume increases, you're going to have uh, an, a higher murmur, a more pronounced murmur uh, in mitral valve prolapse. Um, as far as... Uh, as far as patients with uh, um, with the uh, these irregular menstrual cycles and the overweight woman with uh, facial hair growth, this is uh, are just signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And so this is a patient that if this was an OBGYN question, if it was asking you uh, if she didn't have the click, and uh, this was asking you what the workup would be, you're going to want to get an ultrasound in this patient because it could be uh, she could have abnormal menstrual cycles because of her polycystic ovarian syndrome, or she could have abnormal menstrual cycles because she's pregnant. But the fact that she's having a uh, a, a new diagnosis of of uh, mid systolic click and a mild systolic murmur, uh, that's going to be the uh, mitral valve prolapse because of the increased volume state. So kind of a bunch of diagnoses all in one, but as you can see, I put uh, what is the most likely cardiac diagnosis in this patient, but there's lots of diagnoses in this patient. Okay, so a 61-year-old male presents to the ED complaining of chest pain that's been pers persisting for the last hour. He describes the, pa uh, the pain as tight and rates it as a plus eight out of 10. The pain is midline down his sternum. He's otherwise healthy. Physical exam reveals an anxious man, but otherwise is unremarkable. Which of the following is the best first step in the management of this patient? Is it A, aspirin, B, an EKG, C, an echocardiogram, D, metoprolol, or E, nitroglycerin sublingual? Okay, I'll let you pause it here if you need to. And so this is a man who has substernal chest pain. He is over the age of where you would start to expect, which would be 55 in a man, 65 in a woman, where you would start to suspect coronary artery disease can be a real possibility. And it's a midline substernal pain, uh, and he describes it as tight. Common ways of MI to present are tight, pressure pain. It feels like an elephant is on me. I feel like I can't breathe. That's common for an MI to present us. This has been persisting for the last hour. Otherwise healthy, not uncommon for an MI. This is a patient who is presenting with an MI more than likely. He's got all of the, all of the, the common signs for an MI. The substernal chest pain, it's severe, it's tight, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, otherwise, you know, there's no other symptoms uh, other than just the plain chest pain. Um, this is a, a man with an MI. And so there's a lot of things that you're going to do, and you're going to do these all at the same time. But as far as what the number one most important thing you need to do first is to give this patient an aspirin. Aspirin is going to increase survival. You can get an echocardi or an electrocardiogram, an EKG. You, you need to get an electrocardiogram, but you got to give him that aspirin first because that's going to increase his survival. After you give him that aspirin, then you're going to do the electrocardiogram because yes, you know this guy is having an MI. The electrocardiogram is just going to tell you where, but you got to give this guy an aspirin first. That increases survival. So when you have a USMLE question that's asking you what's the best first step. They're not asking you, what are you going to do? 
What they're asking you is, what is the most important thing to do that's going to increase the survival? Which of these things increases the survival most? Electrocardiogram, well, yeah, that kind of increases survival because it helps you make the diagnosis. But the electrocardiogram itself does not increase survival. It just helps you make the diagnosis. Echocardiogram, you'll do that afterwards. Metoprolol, that you'll give him after he's been admitted and he's in the hospital. Nitroglycerin, that does not increase survival. That just helps the pain from an MI. Aspirin will increase the survival during an MI attack. And this guy has an MI uh, until excluded through electrocardiogram. So you've got to give this guy an aspirin. There is no contraindications in this patient to give him an aspirin, and there's every indication in the world that he needs it because he is having an MI. So the best first step in the management of a patient that is having a, an acute MI uh, that has all the symptoms there and, and you're diagnosing presumptively an MI while the electrocardiogram is on its way down, you're giving that patient an aspirin. Okay, question four. A 61-year-old man uh, presents... Okay, so this is the same patient. Uh, a 61-year-old man presents to the ED complaining of chest pain that has been persisting for the last hour. He describes the pain as tight and rates it as an 8 out of 10. The pain is midline down his sternum. He's otherwise healthy. Physical exam reveals an anxious man, but otherwise unremarkable. He's been given a diagnosis of aspirin. An IV line has been started, and the EKG shows this. Okay, so you've given him the aspirin, that's going to increase his survival. You've gotten the EKG now, that's going to help you make your diagnosis. Now, what's the diagnosis in this guy? Where is the EKG abnormal? You can pause it here if you want. Okay, so this guy has abnormalities in lead 2, in lead 3, and in lead AVF. So... You should always first look for elevations in your ST when you suspect MI. Then you can look for depressions. Elevations are going to are, are going to change your therapy. They're going to be unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI. You'll treat one way. ST elevation MI, STEMI, you're going to treat another way. So you should always look for ST elevation first. You're always going to see reciprocal ST depression when you see ST elevation, or maybe not always, but, but frequently. But you should not ever see ST elevation uh, unless you're having an MI, that's a, a STEMI. So here you have 2, 3, and AVF elevation. So this is an, an inferior wall MI. And now the pain has been going on for the last hour or maybe hour and 10 minutes since it took some time for the EKG to come down. So what are you going to want to do for this guy? You've given him, given him aspirin. You've given him uh, a, a, uh, an, an EKG. You've started an IV line. What are you going to do? Are you going to give him streptokinase? Are you going to give him tis, tissue plasminogen activator or TPA? Are you going to give him metoprolol? Are you going to give him esmolol? Or are you going to give him e-lisinopril? And the answer is tissue plasminogen activator, B. Okay, so he's only had this pain for the last hour, and the window is three hours. And so this is where we differentiate how we treat STEMI versus non-STEMI. If he only had ST depression, we would not use any of these clot busters. We wouldn't use streptokinase or tissue plasminogen activator because he's only got occlusion. He's only got ischemia. This guy has full-on necrosis. And so that's what separates non-STEMI, just the uh, ST depression, from STEMI, which is ST elevation. And, sh and so uh, we're going to give this guy tis tissue plasminogen activator because he's had STEMI and the pain has gone on for less than three hours. So remember both streptokinase and TPA, they're both clot busters, but we prefer if we have the choice to use TPA because if the patient has been given streptokinase before, we don't have a medical history on this guy, but if he had been given streptokinase before and you gave him streptokinase again, he can have an immune response. And so if we're given the choice, if we have the choice, uh, we want to use TPA. That's our, our, best, uh, our best choice for, for breaking the clot down. So remember that as far as using one of these clot busters, 
you're only going to use it in STEMI. You're not going to use it in non-STEMI. So it was very important when you looked at this EKG that you saw that this patient indeed has ST elevation at MI and not non-ST elevation MI. Okay, so TPA. A 39-year-old colleague presents to your clinic while he's supposed to be on vacation. He says that he's feeling palpitations and mild general discomfort. He has a history of asthma, but otherwise you know him to be in good health. You order an EKG, which shows the following. So this is a guy you know, and he's got, uh, he's got, he's stable, and he just has some chest pain and some palpitations. And you got an EKG, and this is what it shows. So what do you think of this EKG? I'll let you pause it here to look at it. Okay, so the choices are A, atrial flutter, B, atrial fibrillation. The question is, what's the most likely diagnosis? Atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, C, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, D, multifocal atrial tachycardia, or E, ventricular tachycardia. And the answer is going to be C, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So... Uh, this EKG is characteristic of uh, uh, any kind of SVT rhythm, but this is going to be a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia because we have no indication to diagnose this patient with multifocal atrial tachycardia. That tends to come up in, uh, in patients who have severe respiratory disease. This patient does have asthma. I put that in there to, uh, to confuse you. Uh, the USMLE will do that to you. Uh, but asthma is not, uh, does not cause multifocal atrial tachycardia. COPD will do that. Um, so, uh, so this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a superventricular tachycardia, uh, and you know that because you've got a, a repolarization of your ventricles. You have a T wave here. You don't have a P wave. Uh, well, you, you may have a P wave, but it's being absorbed into your QRS complex because your heart is beating so fast. And so this you know then to be a supraventricular tachycardia. If it was a ventricular tachycardia, you wouldn't even see the T wave. You would just see uh, Q wide QRS complexes. So this is a supraventricular tachycardia. And the two supraventricular tachycardias here are C and D. Um, if this was, in fact, multifocal atrial tachycardia, even though we don't have any indications on this patient uh, to diagnose multifocal atrial tachycardia, you would see P waves of various morphologies. Remember, that's how we diagnose multifocal atrial tachycardia. So in that case, we have a foci on, we have multiple, fo multiple foci on the atria that are, are feeding into the, uh, to the AV node. Uh, but in this case, we have PSVT paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. We have a regular, a regular rhythm, similar, very similar QRS complexes. We've got ventricular repolarization here in the T waves, and we've got a very fast heart rate. So this is PSVT. Okay, so here you have the, the same patient, and you've got an EKG showing PSVT. So now the question is, which of the following is the most appropriate pharmacologic management of this patient? Is it A, adenosine, B, atropine, C, amiodarone, D, uh, aspirin, or E, atenolol? I'll give you time to pause it. And the answer is A, adenosine. So adenosine is our treatment of choice in patients with PSVT. So we like to give them adenosine. That tends to get them out of, uh, out of their PSVT. Now, I put what's the most appropriate pharmacologic management uh, because in stable patients with PSVT, you can try vagal maneuvers, and that usually is your first choice. And the reason it's your first choice is because it takes a little bit of time to get the adenosine into the patient. Uh, I mean, to, to get the adenosine from wherever you're having it stored in your, uh, in your hospital over into the patient's room. So in the meantime, you can try vagal maneuvers like carotid massage. Uh, that's, that's totally fine. But as far as pharmacologic management, you're going to always use adenosine. Atropine slows the heart. Um, 
or I'm sorry, atropine, uh, atropine speeds up the heart. Uh, so atropine speeding up the heart is something like that you're going to use in a non-stable patient who's got a third degree AV block, for instance. So atropine speeds up the heart. It's a, an anti-sympathetic. Amiodarone is what you're going to use in patients with ventricular tachycardia who are stable. Uh, you can also use that in patients who are having uh, uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, ventricular depolarizations. Uh, aspirin is uh, used for patients with MI, and atenolol is going to be used, uh, well, that's a beta blocker, so that's not going to be used in, in any arrhythmia, really, uh, for acute care. Okay, so question seven. Uh, you're seeing a 72-year-old woman in your outpatient clinic who has been your patient for the last 15 years. She's in for a routine examination. Last year, she had a stroke, which left her with mild left-sided hemiparesis. While hospitalized, she was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. She's currently being treated with metoprolol and verapamil for moderate congestive heart failure, as well as lisinopril for hypertension and diabetes mellitus. Which of the following is the worst prognostic indicator for another stroke in this patient? Is it A, her age of 72, B, her hypertension, C, her diabetes mellitus, D, her congestive heart failure, or E, her history of prior stroke? And the answer is E, her history of prior stroke. All of these are risk factors for another stroke, but a prior stroke is uh, the biggest risk factor. And the way you can re remember this is the CHADS-2 mnemonic. Uh, what this really is is a, uh, a way to uh, classify the patient's risk for uh, developing uh, another stroke. And there's a, uh, if you go back to the, uh, to the lecture that I did on uh, atrial fibrillation, you'll see what the, the percent risk is. It goes, if you have a point of one all the way up to points of six, if you have all of these, it goes anywhere from like 1% up to like 16% annual risk. Uh, so s remember the, the mnemonic is CHADS2. C-H-A-D will each get one point. So congestive heart failure, hypertension, age greater than 75. Actually, She's 72, so that's not a risk factor. Sorry about that. Okay, age greater than 75 would be a, a point. Diabetes would be a point. Uh, stroke history would be uh, two points. So that's going. To, the stroke history is going to be the greatest contributor. Uh, it's going to increase her risk the most. Um, either way, uh, an age greater than 75 will uh, raise her risk, but this woman doesn't have an increased risk due to her age. Okay. So um, I do want to go back, though, and uh, we'll take a quick look at this EKG. So remember back to that PSVT patient. What I want to drill into you is to remember to always look for ST elevation or ST depression in any patient with PSVT. Now, this guy is 39. Yeah, he's probably relatively healthy. Um, so he's not necessarily at risk for an MI. But anytime you have tachycardia, you're increasing the oxygen demand, and if you increase the oxygen demand, a patient that has underlying or subclinical coronary artery disease can lapse into an MI. Uh, they can lapse into STEMI or non-STEMI. Now, you might look at this and say, hey, this patient does have a little bit of ST depression, and yes, he does, but we're going to treat the PSVT. We're not going to treat this guy as a non-STEMI because we can treat the underlying factor. This guy does not have a clot. He just has a high heart rate, and his heart is a little bit ischemic because it's pumping so fast. Uh, and that's probably what's causing the chest pain. He probably has a little bit of angina. Uh, but once we treat that, that PSVT, it'll go away. Now, if, if he had ST depression and he didn't have PSVT, then of course we would treat this as a non-STEMI. But we do want to keep a careful eye out for ST elevation because that would show uh, that would show flat out necrosis of the uh, of the myocytes. So any patient with PSVT or with any tachycardia, keep an eye out for uh, for ST elevation or ST depression because it's good to keep note of. So I just wanted to bring that up, just as sort of a, a clinical note. Okay. 
So question eight, a 61 year old male presents to the ED complaining of severe pain in his chest that came on suddenly while mowing the lawn. He rates the pain as a plus 10 out of 10 and says that it radiates to his back uh, and uh, his left shoulder. He has a history of hypertension, which has been difficult for his primary care physician to control. On physical exam, you see a male in severe distress, heart rate 114, blood pressure 148 over 92, respirations of 22 and mild diastolic murmur and diaphoresis. Which of the following is the next step in management of this patient? Is it A, an electrocardiogram, B, an echocardiogram, C, a spiral CT, D, an aspirin, or E, immediate surgery? I'll give you time to pause. And the answer is C, a spiral CT. So this is a patient who has sudden chest pain it radiates to his back. Severe chest pain in a patient uh, that is radiating to the back, especially if it's an older patient, you need to be thinking of a, uh, an aortic dissection. So I'm not going to say every patient, but in patients where you've got, if, if they're older and it's chest pain that radiates to the back, or in patients uh, that that have hypertension and they have chest, a history of hypertension and they have chest pain and it radiates to the back, these are all patients uh, that you need to get a spiral CT on because you're worried about aortic dissection. Furthermore, this patient has a mild diastolic murmur. And what happens when you have aortic dissection? You have decreased competence of the aorta. So the aorta is going to, the aorta is going to lose blood during diastole. It's going to lose blood back into the left ventricle. And so that's going to cause a diastolic murmur. So hypertension is a significant risk factor for, uh, for aortic dissection, but of course age and the history, the severe pain that radiates to the back, a lot of times you'll often hear them refer to it as a tearing chest pain or a ripping chest pain. Those are all characteristic of, uh, a of an aortic dissection. And the first thing you're going to do in aortic dissection is a spiral CT because it'll help you diagnose it and it will help you locate it. And those are all going to be important because this patient may need immediate surgery. You're never going to send the patient off to immediate surgery. The surgeon will laugh at you um, if, if, if you try to send a patient that you haven't gotten any workup on. Uh, if you try to send them off to the surgeon. Don't even call the surgeon until you've gotten a spiral CT. Electrocardiogram may help you in some way diagnose, but it's not going to be as specific as a spiral CT. Same as echocardiogram. Spiral CT is your best, di or your best diagnostic tool. So spiral CTs are in most EDs now. They're fast. They've gotten cheaper. Um, they're very, very specific and sensitive, so we're going to want to do a spiral CT as a first step in any patient who has uh, a presumed aortic dissection. Okay, 26-year-old male was involved in a motor collision. He is brought to the rural hospital that you are moonlighting. Vital signs are blood pressure 136 over 85 heart rate of 135, respirations of 17, bilateral rib pain, a large contusion in the chest, and various other contusions and abrasions on the extremities. He is awake, alert, and oriented. Lung sounds are clear bilaterally. Heart sounds are distant and tachycardic, tachycardic but normal rhythm and no murmur. EMS has given you the following EKG. Let's take a look at it. So here's his EKG. Okay, I'll let you pause it if you want to look at the EKG. All right, so which of the following is best next step in management? Is it chest x-ray, echocardiogram, spiral CT, immediate surgery, or pericardiocentesis? I'll let you pause it. And the answer is echocardiogram. Okay, so this is a guy, because he has been in a trauma situation, because he has distant heart sounds, he is at risk, and because he has the contusions on his chest, he's got chest injury, he is at risk for, uh, for hemopericardium. And so the distant heart sounds would be a symptom of hemopericardium. The trauma would be a risk factor for hemopericardium. 
So both of those are going to be indications to get an echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is very cheap. It can be done in the trauma bay. It can be done in the ER, uh, in an ER situation. It's very easy to diagnose. Uh, generally, it's good to have two physicians look at it because then you have two opinions, so you make sure that you're not misdiagnosing. Uh, that's just sort of a defensive medicine thing, but it's good to know for for uh, for the the ER or for the clinic. Um, but echocardiogram would be the best choice. You will easily be able to see that blood in the pericardial space. Chest x-ray, you may see blood in the pericardial space, but you probably won't. Spiral CT is overkill. So echocardiogram is the best uh, diagnostic modality. Immediate surgery, no. Uh, we're not going to do immediate surgery for a patient uh, who is stable. Pericardiocentesis, that would be what we would do if he does have blood in his pericardial space, um, and, uh, and, and that would be how we would get it out. But first we would do an echocardiogram before we would do a pericardiocentesis. If he does indeed have blood in the, his pericardial space, then we do a pericardiocentesis. Um, if it's a lot of blood, you can do a peri pericardial uh, window, which is a surgical technique, and that's a surgery question. But uh, this patient certainly is not going to be getting immediate surgery uh, for two reasons. A, he's stable, and B, he needs an echocardiogram uh, to establish the diagnosis. Uh, as far as this EKG, uh, another thing that's common in, uh, in uh, uh, hemopericardium is to get electrical alter alternance. It's also common in uh, cardiac tamponade too. So this patient, based on this EKG, could very well have a, uh, a uh, hemopericardium. So the electrical alternance, remember, is... Uh, so if you look down here to the V6 rhythm, uh, this nice long rhythm here that you have, uh, you've got a short amplitude QRS and a big amplitude QRS, or normal amplitude QRS. So you're alternating QRS amplitudes. Normally, your QRS amplitudes would all be the same. So this is electrical alternance. So if you see a patient, he's got electrical alternance, he's got a chest trauma, he's got distant heart sounds, I would bet that this patient has uh, hemopericardium. But you're definitely going to want to get your echocardiogram first before you do a pericardiocentesis. Now if this question said that the patient has distant heart sounds and he's got weak pulses and he is... Uh, he's disoriented or he's unconscious, then you're just going to go ahead. You've got a presumptive diagnosis already. Don't even bother with the echocardiogram. Just go right in for the pericardiocentesis. Uh, but echocardiograms are very easy to do. We're not talking about a, a, an expensive, you know, full-on Mercedes-Benz echocardiogram that a, a cardiologist would do. We're talking about a simple trauma echocardiogram that can be done in the ER. Uh, and, and this is, is quite easy and will really help you establish the diagnosis. Another thing I want to bring up here, you may see this in, you probably won't see this come up on the USMLE, but you will probably see this uh, quite often if you're working down in the ER uh, or in a trauma bay. Uh, what you see here is this, what almost looks like AFib. This is a typical, uh, this is a typical EKG that's taken uh, by EMS. When you have this, this is just artifact here. Uh, so all this kind of fibrillation-looking stuff, these these uh, little fibr fibrillatory waves uh, here between the QRS and the the P wave. This is all. This is is artifact, and it's from being in the the, the vehicle, and you got some vibrations of uh, on the uh, EKG. So ignore that. Um, you just. I would just look for, if, if it tells you that you're getting it from EMS, uh, just make sure you look for your P wave and your, your, uh, your QRS and your, your T wave. Um, but it's common to have these little uh, artifact uh, things on your, on your EKG, particularly if you're getting it from EMS. Okay. So a 67-year-old female experienced a sudden syncopal episode while at church. She was brought to the ED via EMS and is now awake, alert, and oriented. Blood pressure is 115 over 75, heart rate is 95, and respirations are 14. Which of the following murmurs are you most likely to hear on physical exam? Would it be A, diastolic murmur at the right sternal border, 
B. Holosystolic murmur at the apex. C. Crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the right sternal border. D. Diastolic murmur at the apex. Or E. Mid-systolic click with diastolic murmur at the apex. I'll let you pause it. And the answer is C. Crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the right sternal border. Uh, so at the right sternal border, what are we looking for there? Remember the mnemonic, right sternal border, uh, right upper sternal border, I should say, is uh, A, so that's atrial murmurs, uh, or sorry, aortic valve murmurs. Uh, P would be the left sternal border, so that would be pulmonic valve murmurs. And then the left sternal border uh, would be uh, T, so uh, that would be tricuspid valve murmurs. And then C, the apex, uh, that would be... Um, Alrighty, a 67-year-old female experienced a sudden syncopal episode while at church. She was brought to the ED via EMS and is now awake, alert, and oriented. Blood pressure is 115 over 75, heart rate's 95, respirations are 14. Which of the following murmurs are you most likely to hear on physical exam? Is it A, diastolic murmur at the right upper sternal border? B, holosystolic murmur at the apex. C, crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the right upper sternal border. D, diastolic murmur at the apex. Or E, mid-systolic click with diastolic murmur at the apex. I'll let you pause it here to think about this. And the answer is C, crescendo-decrescendo murmur, or systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the right upper sternal border. So I would say that the most common valvular lesion, uh, actually, I'm, I, the reason I'm not going to tell you this for sure is because I haven't looked at the actual statistics, but I would say the most common valvular lesion to cause syncope uh, in an older patient would be, uh, would be aortic valve stenosis. Uh, so aortic stenosis, the reason it's good to know about how this presents, that it tends to present as syncope, it, it usually presents as syncope, is because when a patient that's older presents with syncope, and by older I mean probably older than 55 or 60, uh, you need to look for, you know, in, a, as, in addition to doing your neurologic exam and your more general cardiac exam, you need to listen to murmurs. And you probably eventually are going to need to get a, an echocardiogram on this patient because aortic stenosis can come with just general aging. You don't have to have any risk factors for it. So we want to look for aortic stenosis in this patient because if aortic stenosis progresses to congestive heart failure and eventually to dilated cardiomyopathy, the patient has a one-year survival rate similar to uh, to cancer. So, to, and by cancer, I mean I mean metastatic cancer. So, we've got to get these patients detected as soon as we can. And once, usually, once it gets to syncope, it's it's usually a deal. Um, so, these patients will usually have to be surgically treated. Um, another reason I gave this question was because it's good to know not only how you hear the murmurs, because a lot of us tend to focus on, oh, is it a diastolic murmur or is it a uh, systolic murmur? That's good to know, but we also need to know where we hear the murmur, because that's going to that's gonna tell us not, not only where we hear the murmur, but where is the murmur most intense. That's going to tell us what valve it's coming from. Anytime a patient has a murmur, yeah, they're going to get an echocardiogram, but it's good for us as the clinicians to know where is this murmur likely coming from. So uh, the right upper sternal border, the left upper sternal border, the left lower sternal border, and the apex, or roughly the uh, the interspace at the uh, the or the um, midclavicular line at the left uh, fifth interspace. Uh, these are the four locations where you will hear your murmurs, if there are any. So aortic is A, P is, uh, is pulmonic, T is tricuspid, and M is mitral. The way to remember this is all physicians take money. Uh, we didn't really talk about the pulmonic and tricuspid murmurs, and the reason is because, one, they're not very common. Two, they tend to happen in children when they do happen. And three, um, well, 
a reason to remember these actually really is you can hear tricuspid murmurs uh, sometimes in IV drug users. So take that little morsel to the USMLE because they like to test that. But really the pulmonary and tricuspid murmurs are not nearly as common, not even remotely as common as the aortic and mitral murmurs. So as far as diagnosing the aortic and mitral murmurs, know that the aortic murmurs are going to be heard at highest intensity at the right upper sternal border. The mitral murmurs are going to be heard at the fifth interspace uh, at the left intercostal line. It could be the sixth interspace too if the patient has congestive heart failure. Uh, so, you know, right here, this kind of shifted over a little bit. But, um, all right, so, uh, so now we know where the murmurs happen. How about when? So when you have a diastolic murmur at the right upper sternal border, so you have a diastolic murmur right here, that's going to be your murmur of aortic regurgitation. During diastole, your left ventricle relaxes, and so blood, if you have aortic regurgitation or aortic incompetence, or if you have, for instance, uh, if you have... Uh, a, a, a um, aortic dissection, for instance, uh, blood can flow back down through the aortic valve and into the uh, into the left ventricle. Now, when would blood flow backwards into the left ventricle? It would most likely flow backwards into the left ventricle when the left ventricle is relaxing. And so when you have the murmur of aortic regurgitation, it happens during diastole because it's easiest for blood to flow backwards when the left ventricle is relaxed. So if you hear a diastolic murmur at the right upper sternal border, that is your murmur of aortic regurgitation. Multiple causes of that, it's going to be based on the patient's scenario. If the patient is stable, no chest pain, aortic regurgitation. If the patient has tearing chest pain that came on suddenly and it radiates to the back and left shoulder, like that patient we saw earlier, then that's going to be more than likely aortic dissection. How about the holo, uh, well, let's, let's skip that for now and let's go to the crescendo, decrescendo murmur at the right upper sternal border. So when would you hear a, uh, a murmur at the aortic valve during systole? You would hear a, a, uh, a murmur during systole uh, when the blood is crossing that valve. So when the blood is crossing the aortic valve, normally, that's during systole. And, and so you hear that murmur because you have a stenosed valve. You, you get turbulence. And so that's going to be aortic stenosis, and that happens, that, that murmur happens during systole. So aortic regurgitation during diastole, blood is flowing backwards. Aortic stenosis happens during systole. Blood is flowing forward the right way, but you've got a little, little opening, and so you hear turbulence. Okay. Holosystolic murmur at the apex. So the apex now is here. Apex is, is by definition, it's where you have, uh, it's, well, it's supposed to be uh, the, the apex of the heart is, a, is an anatomical term, but generally we define this as the point of maximal impulse. So uh, the, in normal patients, that's going to be the midclavicular. I'm sure an, an, an anatomist, if they heard me, would probably be jumping all over me. But uh, generally, we define the apex as the point of ma maximum impulse. And that's going to be the left intercostal space, uh, or the, the, sorry, the left midclavicular line at the fifth intercostal space, or sixth intercostal space if it's a CHF patient. Okay, so if you hear a holosystolic murmur at the apex, so we know it's a mitral valve murmur because it's at the apex, when would you hear a systolic murmur during the apex, or, or dur uh, at the apex? We know that during systole, blood, blood is supposed to be flowing through the aortic valve. It's not supposed to be flowing through the mitral valve. It's when blood flows through the mitral valve, that's supposed to be during diastole because you have blood flowing from the left atrium into the left ventricle. So if you hear a systolic murmur during, uh, during your, uh, your, uh, at your uh, apex where the mitral valve is heard, then you know that blood is flowing the direction that it's not supposed to be going because... Uh, you're hearing a mitral valve murmur during systole. 
blood should not be flowing through the mitral valve during systole. So what you have then is mitral valve regurgitation. So holosystolic murmur at the apex is mitral valve regurgitation. What happens is the left ventricle contracts and rather than the blood going through uh, in, into the, uh, uh, rather than going through up through the, into the aortic valve uh, and, and into the circulation, blood is flowing backwards into the left atrium. And so uh, you, you get your blood flowing through the mitral valve during systole. And that's not supposed to happen. So a holosystolic murmur at the apex is a mitral valve regurgitation. And so keep this in mind, keep the physiologic reason in mind, because when you have a stenosis, uh, or when you have a regurgitation uh, at the aortic valve, you hear a diastolic murmur. When you have a regurgitation at the mitral valve, you get a systolic murmur. And that's just simply due because blood flows through the mitral valve during diastole, and it flows through the aortic valve during systole. Now, a diastolic murmur at the apex, well, when you hear blood flowing through a valve when it's supposed to flow, if you hear it flowing through the valve when it's supposed to flow, then you know you have a, a, a stenotic valve. You're hearing turbulence of the, of the valve, and it's, it's blood moving through there, and it's supposed to be moving through there, but you're hearing it move through there, and that's not supposed to happen. So uh, when you hear a a uh, diastolic murmur at the apex, you're hearing a diastolic murmur, you're hearing blood flowing through the mitral valve during diastole, you know then you have mitral valve stenosis. And again, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it's another uh, valvular lesion. So diastolic murmur at the apex is mitral valve stenosis. So we have diastolic murmur at the right upper sternal border being aortic regurgitation, holosystolic murmur at the apex being mitral valve regurgitation, crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the right upper sternal border being aortic valve stenosis, diastolic murmur at the apex being mitral valve stenosis, and then, of course, the mid-systolic click uh, with diastolic murmur at the apex. The mid-systolic click should tip you right off to uh, a mitral valve prolapse. So this patient uh, is experiencing more than likely aortic valve stenosis. Okay, so question 59 gives us, uh, or sorry, question 11 gives us a 59-year-old man with recent history of MI. He's presenting to your urgent care clinic. He's complaining of significant chest pain. He also says that the pain is worsened when he breathes and when he lays down. Vitals are stable. Physical exam is unremarkable with the exception of his pain which he rates at an 8 out of 10. Which of the following is the best pharmacologic therapy for this patient? Is it A, aspirin, B, nitroglycerin, C, morphine, D, celecoxib, or E, ibuprofen? I would note that your next best type of management of this patient is most certainly going to be an EKG. Any almost 60-year-old that comes in with chest pain, especially after an MI, red flags come up. But if we do need to get him pharmacologic therapy for the condition he appears to have, what would we get out of this list? And the answer is A, aspirin. So this is a guy that had a recent history of MI. It doesn't tell you how long ago, but uh, it's uh, recent. Um, and now he has chest pain. Uh, he's stable, and that's what's most important. And otherwise, the physical doesn't really show anything um, apart from the fact that he has pain. And there's two aspects of his pain. One, it's worsened when he breathes, meaning it's pleuritic pain. And two, it's worsened when he lay lays down, meaning it's prone pain. So the fact that he's got uh, those two types of pain uh, leads credence to the idea that this is acute pericarditis. And furthermore, uh, acute pericarditis has a tendency to happen, uh, not in most cases, but in some cases has a tendency to happen after MI because of the 
the, the healing of the myocytes. And when the myocytes are damaged, they reveal uh, things that were inside the cell, inside the heart cell, that uh, the immune system around the heart is not used to recognizing, and so it goes into an inflammatory response. And that's called Dressler syndrome. So that's more than likely what this patient has. And it used to be up until a while ago, uh, we used to give these patients indomethacin, uh, ibuprofen, uh, meloxicam, not anymore. So the thought is now that by giving the patients NSAIDs, it will reduce the, uh, it will reduce the uh, healing, uh, make it, take it longer to heal. And then if, it, if you're not healed, of course, they're at risk for rupture. So now we just treat them with aspirin. So pericarditis, the most common causes of viral infection. We don't really know what the virus is. You really don't know that you have the virus until you get pericarditis. Other causes include a recent MI, like in this patient, uh, that would be called Dressler syndrome, radiation to the chest, metastatic cancer, and systemic diseases, especially SLE. Uh, the damage leads to an inflammatory process in the pericardium. Uh, the inflammatory process... Uh, causes uh, impact upon the nerves, and that's what's causing the pain. Now, you think about it, when you lay down, you're stretching out your chest cavity. When you're sitting up, the heart is just kind of hanging there, and it has more room. So that's why uh, when you lay down, it's going to irritate the chest cavity when you sit up. It's a little bit better. So the problem here is twofold. First off, the pericardium is mildly inflamed and irritated. Um, this gives you your positional pleuritic chest pain uh, and in a prone position. Uh, remember that the pericardium is relatively in a fixed location compared to the other organs in the chest cavity, and so moving is going to change the property of how you sense in the pericardium. Pain is usually relieved by sitting up. Um, not completely, though. There's still going to be pain. Uh, the pericardium also can become stiff and non-compliant, and so when you do your physical exam, occasionally you can hear a grinding, uh, grating sort of noise. Uh, and so keep that in mind when you're doing your physical examination. Now, it can be really difficult, especially if you're you know, a, a new clinician or not a really, 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 and by really I mean decades experienced uh, examiner, uh, to know what this grating noise sounds like. Uh, other than you uh, kind of moving the bell of the stethoscope over the patient, um, which can do. Uh, I mean, that's it's just a, uh, a sound that you can make on your own. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you to listen to the uh, to some of the audio that you can find online uh, that gives you what this uh, is called. It's called a pericardial friction rub, and this is characteristic noise, a gr grating noise. Uh, that you hear, and this is just because you have an inflammatory, uh, stiff, non-compliant pericardium that's uh, now making noise as the heart is moving around as it does when it beats. So the history in pericarditis patients, uh, positive risk factors for pericarditis, so a recent viral infection, usually we don't know about that though, uh, recent MI, cancer, radiation, renal failure, SLE, uh, autoimmune disease. The renal failure is a big one. Uh, that's just because of the azotemia, um, and that's it. it. The azotemia causes inflammation and irritation of the pericardium. Symptoms are chest pain, which is relieved by sitting up, worsened by laying down and breathing. Physical exam reveals a pericardial friction rub. That Remember, that's not pathognomonic, but it's, uh, it's not always heard in some patients, but when it is there in the presence of a patient with symptoms, uh, and a positive history, then that really should heighten your diagnosis. Low-grade fever can be present uh, just due to the inflammatory process as well as a borderline low pulse ox, and that would probably be due to the fact that these patients aren't breathing as hardly because it hurts so bad for them to breathe. Diagnosis, you're going to do an EKG, and the EKG shows rather characteristic results for pericarditis. It's a PR depression, and an ST elevation. And that ST elevation and PR depression are diffuse. So if you saw ST elevation in only certain leads, of course, the big thing we're thinking of is a STEMI. Uh, however, when you see diffuse ST elevation in all the leads, 
then it's probably pericarditis. And again, it's you just remember the history and the symptoms and the physical examination leads you to believe already it's pericarditis. By the time you get your EKG, you're already thinking you know what it is, and the EKG just confirms it. After that, though, you should uh, get an echocardiogram to determine the extent of the uh, effusion, the inflammation. Um, so as long as the patient is stable, get the EKG first. Uh, but uh, if the patient is unstable, there are going to be other things that you're going to have to do as far as stabilizing the patient, administering fluid, securing a line, uh, etc. Uh, again, the treatment is aspirin. Uh, that's primarily to relieve the pain. You can add corticosteroids on top of that uh, to reduce some of the inflammation. But primarily here, we're treating them symptomatically. We want to make sure that there's uh, the, their, uh, they don't go unstable. They'll need to be admitted, and usually within days, this will relieve itself. Okay, 12. A 42-year-old woman presents to your primary care office for her annual checkup. She was diagnosed last year with hypercholesterolemia with LDL levels of 162 and 169 on separate fasting lipid panels. Her most recent LDL level was 163. Let's say that's the one you got today. She says that she goes to the, uh, she goes to the gym three times per week and has been carefully monitoring her diet. She's five foot four inches tall and weighs 180 pounds, but otherwise she's in good health and has no significant family history. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Is it A, pravastatin, B, simvastatin, azetamide, C, niacin, D, gemfibrozil, E, increase exercise frequency to five times per week. Let's pause it here. Okay, so here you have a patient who has had uh, diagnosed hypercholesterolemia. She had more than one high LDL on separate, uh, so on, on lipid panels. Remember, you have to have more than one fasting lipid panel that's demonstrating an LDL that's higher than uh, what the optimal level is. For this patient, the optimal level I would say would be 160. Uh, her only real uh, risk factor here is obesity. Um, so uh, I would say she's got zero to one uh, risk factors. Um, so if she if you've got zero to one risk factors, the the optimal LDL level is less than 160. If you have two or more risk factors, then the uh, optimal LDL level is greater than uh, or is less than 130. If you are diagnosed with abdominal aortic aneurysm, peripheral artery disease, coronary artery disease, or diabetes mellitus, with one of those, then the optimal LDL value is 100. If you're diagnosed with uh, more than one of those four illnesses, then the optimal LDL value is less than 70. Now, in a patient who has a high LDL level for what their risk factors are. So really in any patient who has an LDL level of greater than 160, as long as their LDL level is not more than 30 points above their optimal level, so in this case, a patient who has an LDL level more than 190, then we're going to start them on just diet and exercise, a, a, a low fat diet and frequent exercise. Uh, and then what we'll do then is we will recheck it in four or five months. And if it continues to be high, then we will start them on hypercholesterolemics. So remember that if you're abnormal, but you're not more than 30 points abnormal, it's just going to be diet and exercise. And remember what the abnormal levels are, 160, 130, 100, or 70, based on if it's 0 to 1 Framingham risk factors, more than two Framingham risk factors. If they have one diagnosis of AAA, PAD, CAD, or diabetes mellitus, or uh, more or two or more of those diagnoses, then it will be respectively 160, 130, 100, or 70. If you're more than 30 points above what the upper limit of normal is, then you'll just go straight to uh, anti-hypercholesterolemics. So now this is a patient who has refractory hypercholesterolemia. And in a patient who has refractory hypercholesterolemia that's not responsive to diet or exercise, then you can start uh, an anti-hypercholesterolemic. 
So why would you want to use pravastatin? Well, first of all, it's good to know that pravastatin, uh, or well, any statin really, is, is going to be your first drug of choice in a patient with high LDL levels. Uh, really, the other drugs are, are more second line. Uh, so simvastatin, ezetimibe, that's another possibility, but it's not going to be your first choice because ezetimibe is something you're going to add on usually when, when, uh, when the patient's not responsive to the statin alone. Niacin tends to uh, increase HDL levels, but it's not as good for lowering LDL levels, and there's some problems with patient compliance. And uh, so remember that your statins are your first drug of choice, uh, for any patient that has uh, has elevated LDL levels and you need to start uh, medical therapy. Uh, and of course, the exceptions are patients who are pregnant uh, and patients who uh, have significant liver disease. Okay, so a 70-year-old male has been under your care on the medical unit for a treatment following an anterior ST elevation myocardial infarction. As you arrive for work, the charge nurse informs you that although he is stable, he has been running an abnormal EKG pattern, as shown below. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Is it A, digoxin, B, atropine, C, amiodarone, D, synchronized cardioversion, or E, consult for pacemaker? And the answer is E, consult for pacemaker. Okay, so this can be uh, somewhat confusing because you might think, oh, well, this patient has a, a low heart rate. We need to treat them with atropine because we need to raise their heart rate. Raising a heart rate in and of itself is not necessary. If the patient is stable, you do not need to raise the heart rate. If the patient's blood pressure drops, then you're gonna give the patient atropine. But you don't need to give atropine unless the patient becomes unstable or their blood pressure drops to uh, drops below normal. So, of course, digoxin uh, is, is uh, not going to be used for, uh, for this patient. This patient's EKG uh, is bradycardic and uh, it appears that they are uh, that they have a, a block. So this uh, is a third degree block. Um, I, I did that, so just know that. <laughs> um, but uh, this is a third degree block, and uh, so digoxin is used for atrial fibrillation. Um, that usually show well if atrial fibrillation shows an abnormal heart rate, it will usually be uh, tachycardia. Atropine, of course, uh, we could use on this patient, but we would like to wait until the patient is unstable if they ever become unstable, because a patient can be perfectly stable just like this. Uh, but we'd want to have the atropine ready. Uh, amiodarone uh, is, is not going to be used in this patient. That's going to be used uh, for, for uh, ventricular tachycardia. Synchronized cardioversion is not going to be of use in this patient because they have uh, th this is due to a, uh, a, a lesion on, in the uh, conduction system. So you're not going to be able to cardiovert the patient out of this block. Cardioversion is better for like VTAC or, or, uh, or PSVT. Uh, so you definitely want to consult for pacemaker because a third degree AV block is an absolute indication for uh, a pacemaker. So this is a third degree AV block. And remember that third degree AV block is uh, basically where you have a, no association between your QRS complexes and your P waves. So in other words, you have no association between when the atria are contracting and when the ventricles are contracting. So you'll see P waves at random times and QRS waves at random times. So here is in green, these are our, our P waves. It's kind of hard to discern whether they're P waves or T waves, but uh, this is my judgment. I, uh, either way, you're not, getting, you're not getting normal P waves before your QRS complexes, and they're occurring at 
abnormal times and you have bradycardia. So all that would lead you to believe third degree AV block. I'm not a professional EKG reader, but uh, these all appear in my professional opinion to be to be P waves. And these are obviously all QRS complexes in red. And good to differentiate this between uh, from second degree AV block Mobitz type two. So in, in second degree AV block Mobitz type two, what you'll have is, is you're gonna have a P wave before your QRS complexes, but what you also have are dropped QRS complexes. So here there are, yes, there are dropped QRS complexes. You have a P wave with no QRS complexes. But the reason that this is a, uh, a third degree AV block is that there's no association at all between P waves and QRS complexes. Whereas in your second degree Mobitz type two, you do have an association with your P wave and QRS complexes, but you have dropped QRS waves, regular dropped QRS complexes. Now, if it was Mobitz type one, remember that, that's the Wankybach uh, AV block. What you would have there is you would have a progressive PR elongation and then a QRS uh, drop. But here you've got dropped QRS complexes, multiple dropped QRS complexes occurring regularly. And you don't have a progressive PR elongation. So that makes it Mobitz type 2. And remember that both second degree AV block Mobitz type 2 and third degree AV block, so both of these are going to need pacemakers. If it's Mobitz type 1 second degree or if it's uh, just simple first degree, so just simply a, uh, an elongated PR interval, then you don't need a pacemaker unless you develop symptoms. And of course those symptoms would be hypotension, etc. Okay, 17 year old male presents to the ED by ambulance after suddenly losing consciousness during a soccer match. IV fluids are started and he is now awake, conscious, and stable. He has no significant medical history. Blood pressure is 128 over 83. Heart rate is 94. Respirations are 16. Physical exam reveals a lean, healthy appearing male. On auscultation, you hear a faint holosystolic murmur that becomes louder during Valsalva. No other significant findings. Based on clinical findings, what is the most what is most likely the best management for this patient? A hydrochlorothiazide. B, furosemide, C, hydration before vigorous activity, D, total avoidance of vig vigorous physical activity, or E, consult surgery for myectomy. I'll give you some time to pause it here. And the answer is going to be D, total avoidance of vigorous physical activity. So first off, let's figure out what this patient has. So it's a young guy, good health, Nothing visibly abnormal with him other than he had sudden loss of consciousness during a soccer match, which of course we know soccer is a very aerobic, high intensity physical activity. So he suddenly lost consciousness. And what you should always associate a sudden loss of consciousness in a teenager or a young adult is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And that's indeed what this patient has. Remember that, the, uh, that there are... are Four lesions where the murmur will improve with Valsalva. And there are two murmurs that the murmur will get louder during Valsalva. So the four murmurs that get quieter or better during Valsalva would be your, your, your aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, and mitral regurgitation. Why? Because all of those uh, are due to uh, are, are, are valvular lesions. So anything, if, if, if you're told that it becomes quieter during Valsalva or, uh, or louder during leg lift, then what you have is uh, more than likely a, uh, a valvular lesion, a stenosis or a regurgitation. Now on the other hand, uh, the two that get louder during Valsalva and quieter during leg lifts or squatting uh, would be either hypertrophic, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or mitral valve prolapse. Now, why do they get louder during Valsalva and quieter during, 
during, uh, during squatting or leg lifts. What causes these murmurs? These murmurs are caused by, uh, by l uh, less blood flow through the heart. So if you go back to uh, the, the uh, section we had on valvular disease, uh, I kind of explain this in greater detail. But what happens during uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is that if you have less blood moving through your system, so let's say you're dehydrated, you have less blood moving through your system, that hypertrophic septum can block your aortic tract outflow, your outflow from your left ventricle into your aorta. And so hydration is going to keep that, that, that tract open better. And so when you have dehydration, when you have less blood flow, you're going to get greater obstruction. If you get greater obstruction, you're going to have, and if you have less flow, you're going to have a louder murmur. It's not necessarily because the murmur is getting worse. It's more so because you have less flow. And, and, and so therefore you're, you're getting, uh, you're, you're getting, uh, well, yeah, you're getting a, a worse murmur uh, because you have uh, you have your your hypertrophic septum blocking it, but more so because you have less flow going through there, so it's easier to hear uh, because uh, more of the uh, more of the the blood is is moving through stenotic uh, moving through blocked areas. So. Uh, during Valsalva, if you hear a louder murmur, if the murmur gets louder, you should think of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or, uh, or mitral valve prolapse. Another thing that I want to, to talk about as far as mitral valve prolapse getting louder, the only part of the mitral valve prolapse that will get louder during Valsalva is just the, the click. If you have regurgitation associated with your mitral valve prolapse, that won't get louder during Valsalva. Uh, so remember that hokum and MVP will both get louder during Valsalva. That's going to help you differentiate it from the other murmurs. And because remember, what what other murmurs can be faint holosystolic murmurs or holosystolic murmur in general? Aortic stenosis. Well, this patient clearly does not have aortic stenosis because he's 17. But if you had a 40 year old patient, you might wonder. Um, so. Uh, as far as Valsalva, that's, it can be confusing. Hopefully I made that a little bit clearer. Uh, but hokum and, uh, and mitral valve prolapse both get worse, both get louder during Valsalva. Okay, so as far as what we do for this patient, hokum, always, always, always no physical activity. I'm not saying they can't walk, but it's definitely no soccer, no basketball. Uh, we want to make sure they stay hydrated, so definitely A and B are wrong. We, we, we really want to avoid anything that might dehydrate uh, a patient with hokum. So uh, these diuretics are, are always wrong. Um, hydration before vigorous physical activity, well, if he had to engage in vigorous physical activity, then yes, we would want to make sure he's hydrated because that hydration is going to keep that, that hypertrophic septum out of the way. But we want to just avoid vigorous physical activity altogether. That's the best way to, uh, to prevent sudden death in these patients, which can happen. So total avoidance of physical, vigorous physical activity. Uh, as far as surgery for myectomy, yes, you can do that if it gets worse. If he has symptoms without physical activity, you can have surgery for, uh, for, for, for this condition, but that's not our first line of therapy. Okay, and then one last thing here. What is this EKG tracing? What do we have here? We have ST elevation. But where is it? It's everywhere. What's ST elevation when it's everywhere? Pericarditis. So I was going to put this in with the one pericarditis patient, but I didn't want to make you think that EKG is the first step. So if you ever have an EKG like this where you have diffuse ST elevation, Think pericarditis. And that's it.